sometimes weird is used in a way that, you know, sort of like, that's weird and we stay away from it, so it's sort of like a, a negative term, but then I think at the same time weird can also be a term of sort of individuality and uniqueness, which is something that we should embrace, so, you know, find your inner weirdness and, and don't, don't hide it, you know, be weird, it's cool. Um, so I'm here um, as, how do I get this started here? Okay, where's other way? Okay, yeah, the back button, that's weird. Um, <coughs> no, it's because I was holding it upside down, so. <laughs> so I'm uh, Colin Ford, I'm a marine biologist, I am one half of coral morphologic and I'm here to tell you about uh, what I do in the weird world of corals, um, which are animals, which to many people this is a surprise. Um, they're certainly weird animals, so we're going to go and we'll get to that. But like I mentioned, uh, coral morphologic is a, is a hybrid art science endeavor. Um, I studied marine biology at the University of Miami. I came to Miami interested in, already interested in corals, knowing that um, corals were growing here in Miami and South Florida. Um, but once I got to Miami, I really um, became very inspired by my creative friends that I met, um, artists and musicians. And um, this was back in, you know, in the early 2000s when Wynwood and art walks and things were first developing. And it was really inspiring. And I realized that these animals that I was interested in and studying these corals had a lot of similarities to the city, and they were beautiful, um, and that there was a story that needed to be told. And so uh, coral morphologic was kind of a, an attempt to, to create something unique for the city um, that was sort of um, different and hadn't been yet um, a, to a story that hasn't been told yet. So um, that's me, my best friend Jared. I've been bros since middle school. Um, so we grow, we grow corals, we aquaculture corals. Um, aquaculture is really important. Um, the concept of aquaculture is something we all need to be thinking about in the future. You know, when you go to the, the supermarket and you're buying meat, if you eat meat, um, you know, all that meat comes from farms, but a lot of that fish comes from the wild. So, you know, it's not like you go to the supermarket and buy deer that somebody, a hunter, shot. Um, but we still kind of do that with the ocean, and we're not going to be able to do that forever because there's more people and there's less fish. So aquaculture is really important. Corals, are, you can aquaculture them, and um, we'll get to that. So in 2007, when coral morphologic started, I guess I'd describe it as an attempt to create a vertically integrated and self-sustaining coral aquaculture lab to study and explore coral morphs and zoanthids. Um, these are weird coral cousins, the coral morphs and zoanthids. Nobody really in the world studies coral morphs. Um, I couldn't find a school to go study coral morphs. So the only way that I could pursue what I wanted to do was to create my own do-it-yourself um, platform. So that's just what you do. Um, but today, uh, in 2016, if I had to define what coral morphologic is, I might say it's a time and space specific attempt to catalyze a human coral symbiosis through science, technology, art, aquaculture, metaphor, activism, fashion, and empathy. An attempt to elevate corals into pop iconography in order to enable a collective paradigm shift in our awareness of life on Earth and our place in the cosmos. So we get deep, we get weird. Um, and this is based off of a, a premise that uh, if for anyone that sort of is studying corals, um, and life on Earth in general, that survival for both corals and humans in the future will be determined by our ability to morph and adapt logically to accelerating change. So you know, the world that we're born into is basically a world that changes um, these days. It seems almost every year, every five years, we have totally new technology that we need to uh, integrate into our, into our world. And so um, you know, humans need to constantly be adapting and evolving or else you get left behind. Um, and, Corals are cemented in place in the world's uh, tropical oceans, and with climate change and pollution, they don't really have the ability to just sort of um, find uh, a more hospitable place to live. So they have to just they have to deal with it. It's adapt or die for a coral. <clears throat> and I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from corals in their ability to to do just that. Um, so you know, corals are often held as kind of the canaries in the coal mine of of the planet Earth. 
I would agree with that to a certain extent, um, but at the same time, you know, the canary is sort of like a caged bird that really has no, um, no free will, um, whereas I believe that corals have something to offer humans to learn from them. Um, so, you know, that's, it's not that we're sort of like the knight in shining armor to these poor caged birds. Um, I think that there's sort of a two, a, a dual directional um, exchange of, of, of information that can help us both. So a lot of what we do, hybridizing art and science, I feel revolves around this idea of um, kind of storytelling, metaphors, and even mythology to a certain degree. Corals are animals that don't have a, a historical mythology connected to them, which I find highly unusual. Um, so it's really exciting to be able to kind of create stories um, in a mythology that hasn't really been told yet. And I think that we can build a future mythology as opposed to a historical mythology with corals because they're, they're kind of the, you know, the, the harbingers of, of, of change and um, you know, global kind of uh, adaptation. So a big one is that uh, the coral reef is like a city. Um, Coral reefs are kind of the most urban of the natural ecosystems. Um, and, and Miami, specifically, is the coral city. It's a city that once um, you know, was underwater. Everything in South Florida at one time was underwater. The highest elevations in the city are fossilized coral reefs. So you know, it really puts things into perspective. And the concrete that our buildings are made out of, you know, chemically, are basically the same um, composition of, of the coral reef and we grind up this fossilized um, marine life and we turn it into cement. Um, and ultimately, you know, when you take a step back away from our planet, um, you see that we're kind of like a fishbowl floating in space. Um, so this is hopefully a, a good perspective. It's really important that we, you know, to think 500 years ago we thought that the Earth was flat and was the center of the universe, um, you know, and corals have inherently understood this for half a billion years. Um, and humans are just really figuring this out now. We have a really awesome moon, also something to not uh, take for granted that we have one really cool moon that makes our tides perfect and um, you know, gives us just enough chaos but not too much chaos. Um, having two moons would be heavy. Um, and so let's, let's kind of zoom down to, to Miami, um, the Coral City. You can see Miami's really kind of like an artificially constructed place. Um, all of the islands of, um, of the Venetian Causeway, Star Island, Palm Island, and Hibiscus Island, the port, uh, Brickell Key, they're all man-made, um, as is, of course, much of Miami Beach is dredged and just manufactured real estate, because that's what South Florida is really all about, right? It's a, it's a real estate. Um, it always has been a real estate scheme from the get-go. Um, and we just keep rolling, these, rolling the dice until we'll see what happens with, uh, with the weather and climate. But, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a highly unusual place in that it's one of the only places in the world that I know of where corals are pioneering into habitats where they previously never could live, um, which, is, which is remarkable. You think that we have this big city, you think pollution, you think the corals should probably be you know, dead and dying and, and, and just sort of getting away from the city as far as they can. But actually, you know, because here's the Miami River, um, the Army Corps drained the Everglades over the past hundred years, so all of the fresh water that used to come out of the river doesn't come, come through the river anymore. Um, so that means that Biscayne Bay is, is a saltwater bay. Um, and then we have um, government cut, which allows the ships to come into the port. Um, that basically acts as like a, as like a sluiceway. It allows the the clean water from offshore to come right into the city on a high tide um, and gives us it much cleaner water than we would otherwise have. And then finally, uh, corals needed a place to, to live. They need substrate. Typically, Biscayne Bay was just mud and mangroves. Um, but because we've built these islands um, and we have um, this man-made infrastructure to keep everything in place, we need cement, we need rocks, um, and the corals are actually able to attach onto them, which is really amazing. These are corals that, that now I've been studying for um, the past seven years or so. So um, the city itself, you can find corals throughout the city. Coral Gables is named for um, the architecture that uses um, 
this keystone, which is fossilized coral limestone. So, whoops, so when you're walking around a town, um, you know, you, you'll see um, in facades or in walkways, South Point Park is one of my favorite places, has really great keystone. This is the historic courthouse downtown. It's one of the largest limestone buildings um, in the world. Um, so we do things like uh, public art projects uh, where we're trying to bring the corals back into the city. Um, we like to project them onto buildings because this sort of references um, the fact that you know, corals used to be living. Um, the city was underwater. There were corals here. Now we've built these buildings which are sort of like similar to corals um, out of their recycled remains and then in the future with sea level rise basically we've cr created a perfect artificial reef for the corals to come back and, and grow on our city. And the fact that we have corals moving into the city suggests to me that yes, they will continue to move in as we move out. So um, there's some poetic justice here, which is exciting. Um, and so, yeah, we've done, um, Malik mentioned, we did a project with um, Bhakti Baxter at uh, Port of Miami and then we, we've, whoops, we wrapped, we wrapped the, uh, the parking booths with soft corals that are native to the port. Um, in fact, it's a new species of zoanthid that, um, that I discovered. So it's amazing, you know, the fact that we have new species living right here under our nose. Um, you know, what you can find in your own backyard can sometimes be really um, amazing if you sort of let yourself open to the idea that really amazing things can be in your backyard. Um, this was at the airport. Unfortunately, it just came down after being up for a couple of years. Um, this was at the Calabo show a couple of years ago. Um, it's a metaphor here. Um, this is again, yeah, doing in addition to the to to the art um, work with other scientists around the world, like getting those those zoanthids uh, um, genetically um, analyzed, and we've determined that they're a new species. And um, you know, trying to bring technology, basically, um, you know, converge science and art and technology in a way that allows people to experience corals and coral reefs um, in a way that basically you'd have to be a scuba diver or um, an aquarist to experience. And so, you know, these are really important things I think in the future to get people engaged and involved in um, the planet that we live on because it's really easy to get disconnected. Um, from that, so if we can use technology, um, then that's great. Let's get weird. Um, something most recently that we did, we donated uh, a big tank to Coral Gables uh, Senior High School, and um, kids have been doing a really great job growing corals. It's actually, I'd say, probably one of the most inspiring things that I've done in the city to work with um, the high school kids because they're so appreciative. Um, Coral Gable Senior High School hasn't really been uh, upgraded probably since some of you may have attended it. Um, so they're really, they're really appreciative of, of anything that um, they can get that's new and, and, um, and exciting and um, they're in the future so it's exciting for us. So um, a lot, my interest in these, um, these corals in the city all, all started about 2009 when I found this hybrid elkhorn staghorn coral growing in government cut. Um, and this is a coral that I've never seen anywhere else in Florida um, and is, is both its parents are endangered species and here is this hybrid coral living in an industrial shipping lane. It was, it just sort of blew my mind that um, that, that could happen. So ever since since that point in time, been explore, I've been exploring the habitats um, and have determined that really Miami is like a a living laboratory itself. Um, and so it's only been, you know, through billions of dollars of taxpayer um, and private investment, we've sort of created um, these new habitats, which are, I think, really important in order to have, um, for us to understand how these corals are, are able to um, adapt and, and, and survive around all of this um, human infrastructure. So, the past few years, we've been trying to get a, um, a coral nursery along South Point Park. Um, it's really expensive to do these and, and an incredible amount of bureaucratic red tape. Um, we're dealing with city, county, state, and federal regulations all converging, um, which is, and they don't want to have to deal with it because 
how interwoven all of these entities are. So unfortunately, we've found that I think in the powers that be, they, they just kind of want to ignore the fact that these are interesting corals worth studying and just sort of gloss it over um, like they're not that important. So it's a little frustrating um, to try and build this uh, kind of consensus that, that this would be a really great thing to both better understand the corals that we have here in this city, but also to be able to like put a camera underwater um, and be able to live stream it onto the internet so that people can constantly kind of see what's going on. Um, so this is, I'll just actually, I'll go back. So this is right here at the tip of the, tip of the port of Miami. Um, and this is one of my favorite um, sites for marine life in, in Miami, it's, it's really incredibly diverse. It's kind of like where the ocean and the bay meet. Um, and um, there's already been some corals that were transplanted there when they replaced the sewage line across government cut. So it's sort of like an insta reef. Um, they replaced all these rocks in 2010. But, um, you know, if I think that if I just kind of showed you this, we'd have no idea that this was entirely a man made um, habitat. And, it's literally right next to uh, the shoreline where uh, the pilot boats go in and out of the port. So this is a site that we've been, that we've been uh, wanting to install a live streaming underwater camera just because it's like we have our own public aquarium here already in the water um, and there's no walls and the, and the fish are just naturally doing their thing. Um, and so again, another expensive project um, with a lot of permitting, but um, it's something that we really feel will be a great asset to local schools um, and to tourism because you, I feel like with all of the negative kind of publicity that Florida's gotten with algae blooms and um, kind of, you know, the Indian River Lagoon dying uh, further north, you know, to put a camera underwater here in Biscayne Bay and to see this marine life, um, you know, really goes to show that, you know, you don't have to go to the middle of the Caribbean to find um, basically all of the same marine life. Um, and that's another really important thing, I think, about the corals of Miami is that this, you know, Miami is kind of like a, a connective point for South America, Central America, and the Caribbean. Um, and the coral reef is kind of the, is the connective ecosystem that, that all of these countries um, share in common. So, you know, here we are in Miami where we've got the Gulf Stream um, bringing all of this marine life from the rest of the Caribbean. And so, you know, if you're from some other place in the Caribbean or Central South America, like, you know, we have kind of a piece of, of this, we have a shared backyard. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, another really, as a metaphor, you know, we have, we've got this really colorful, um, neon marine life that we, that we have living here, which, which I think kind of represents a little bit of, of the kind of tropical color and diversity of um, cultures that we have here in Miami. So um, a really health, you know, surprisingly healthy spot. It's a little silty here because this was, I think I filmed this when the dredge was still happening. The dredge is now over, thankfully, uh, but they're wanting to move up to Fort Lauderdale next year, which is, a really bad idea. More, actually, more corals in Fort Lauderdale than there is here in Miami, um, offshore at least. Inshore, we have much, much healthier corals um, than they do in Fort Lauderdale. Um, so sooner here, we're gonna, you'll see at night um, how the corals are fluorescent. And that's kind of another thing, you know, people think of Miami, we've got big snook here, um, Think of Miami, think about like nightlife and neon lights and you know, the corals were kind of the original neon denizens of Miami. Um, and, you know, and that's again something that they've been fluorescent and neon for millions of years and really neon didn't enter into our collective consciousness until people started taking LSD in the 1960s. So um, I like to point out that the first time that, that uh, coral fluorescence was uh, brought to people's awareness uh, was a coffee table book that came out in 1964. Um, and then two years later, Yellow Submarine came out. And so, you know, I find that these, these are like connected um, cultural 
events. Um, because really, I mean, when you think about it, um, you go back 100 years and you think about kind of like the, the color palette that people were kind of their reality and how different it is to ours today. Um, so this is, this is at nighttime using a blue uh, wavelength LEDs um, on the brain corals there at the, at the port. Um, and so this just shows you this natural fluorescence um, that many corals have. Um, and so, yeah, we sort of t we take we take the fluorescence uh, for granted, um, but um, you know, 150 years ago, just the the skeleton of a coral was curious and interesting, and um, you know, and it was it was highly collectible. Um, and Darwin, who we know to be um, sort of the the father of of modern genetics and, and or really evolution. Um, his first book was on coral reefs. He was the first guy to write a book about coral reefs. Before he was interested in um, evolution, he was interested in um, corals and, and how coral atolls formed. Um, and that sort of led him through a rabbit hole um, of which corals kind of allowed him to see the way things, time works on a much slower scale than this biblical creation time, which you know when Darwin was around was the accepted still accepted as, as fact. Um, and he, he was able to understand that, that processes on Earth take a lot longer than, than the Bible um, and, and was able to then see how evolution would take a very long time but would, would in fact um, you know, be the dominant um, way in which life evolves on Earth. So this is just uh, what we want to put there is the underwater camera. Um, this is our nursery, the rendering that we want to do. Um, this is a, a really um, famous, one of the most famous dive sites in Mexico, um, the Underwater Sculpture Museum, and it's the most popular dive site in Cancun. Um, and it just demonstrates how art um, and artificial reef building can go hand in hand, literally, um, and, um, and how you know, not only does that create habitat, but it also um, creates ecotourism. And I think that Miami is in a, is in a great position to be able to um, become a place where art and science and ecotourism um, can, can converge and, and create a new draw to the city. But, you know, again, trying to get the, the people in charge to see the, the logic of this is a lot more frustrating than you can imagine. So, um, near the weird, weird fact about Miami. Um, did you know that there's a meteorite crater um, right off shore Fisher Island? Um, I know this because it's on Google Earth. Um, <laughs> but you, if you can see, this is a, this is a LIDAR um, scan. And unfortunately, all this kind of raised, um, the red, darker red here, is spoil from um, the Army Corps decades ago when they um, needed to dump their their dredge, they just dumped it over here. And unfortunately, they inadvertently filled up um, the Miami meteorite crater. But you can still see the concentric um, uh, walls of the, of the crater and even the, uh, the shatter cone in the center. Um, so it's unfortunately, the Army Corps filled it up you know, long before anyone knew it was a meteorite crater. It's kind of boring underwater, but it seems like a really ideal place for a, a, an underwater sculpture gallery of massive proportions because um, because you can see it from space, and it's a meteorite crater, and there's no place on Earth you could actually do that. In fact, there's no other meteorite craters in limestone anywhere on Earth that anybody knows about. Um, and apparently, we have one in our backyard. Um, yeah, so there it is again. Um, this would be really cool to, to turn something that's otherwise a sort of a rubble zone into a place. This is only 25 feet. It's not very deep. You can snorkel it. Um, but, you know. We just need to figure out how to make our millions first, um, or get somebody get somebody to, to give us their millions. Um, and then finally, um, I'm sure all of you guys have um, driven across the MacArthur Causeway a million times. It connects Miami to Miami Beach. Um, and there are hundreds of brain corals that live directly along the side of the highway. Um, and it's crazy. You go to you if you walk walk along the shoreline. It's you know it's disgusting. There's trash. There's all manners of things that you would look at and say I'm not getting in the water, but I still get in the water. Um, and um, and it's remarkable. You know these are all corals that that have just pioneered 
moved into this habitat somewhere in the past um, 20, 20 years, because um, these the riprap that was put there is, I think, only from the early 90s. Um, and again, you know, this is like a really remarkable that we would have these um, these corals, healthy corals, big corals, growing a stone's throw from a bus stop. Um, and it's remarkable the, the amount that you see trash thrown in the water, but then you see sponges and corals growing on that trash, like shopping carts, um, bicycle frames. Um, and so, I mean, when we make artificial reefs, you know, the government often sinks big ships and turns it into dive sites. Um, so inside the bay, a shopping cart is sort of like a micro wreck. You know, it, it acts, it, it functions very, very similar to the way um, an aircraft carrier sunk in, in 150 feet of water, um, you know, can act as, a, as an artificial reef. Not that I'm suggesting we should throw all the shopping carts um, in Miami into Biscayne Bay, but it would create a lot of habitat. <laughs> um, and so this just kind of runs, runs on for a few minutes. Um, that's kind of the bulk of, of what, yeah, there's, see there's the, there's the, um, the bus stop, bus stop corals. It's not too many places in the United States where you've got bus stop corals. So, you know, Miami's really, I feel like Miami is really easy to get picked on in the media. Um, a lot of shade and Freud about Miami. People like to, they want to see us go underwater. Um, but at the same time, there's, we have, that's because they're jealous, naturally, right? Um, why, else do, why else do haters hate? Um, so, um, you know, hopefully this gives you a perspective on something now where you can feel really smug about the fact that your city has something that no other city um, has. And, despite the fact that we have sewage leaks um, that are constantly going into the bay. These are corals that are dealing with these sewage leaks um, and, and surviving. So um, from, a, from an evolutionary perspective, they are extremely fit um, and, and truly resilient and deserve, deserve study. And so hopefully um, that'll be something that we get to do you know, for the next 10 years or longer. Um, to be able to study and, and, and understand how these corals are surviving because then we can understand how corals around the rest of the world are going to be able to adapt in the future. So, didn't realize we had a soundtrack on this one, but um, so, yeah, do I have any, any questions? Okay. Yeah, you can turn the sound off. Just, I have a So the kind of question, just as a suggestion and thought, um, is it's a really interesting project and there's so much going on about the environment with sea level rise as well as a cross section with art. Mm -hmm. um, there are some artists that are working on these projects. And so have you thought of working with the Traveling Convention Bureau in terms of funding as well as um, FIU over on uh, uh, Miami Beach mm -hmm. with the um, studio? Yeah, I'm actually I'm working. Yeah. Just started working with uh, FIU um, Urban um, Studios. Um, Going to be speaking this next Wednesday on the main campus at the Architecture School of Architecture. Um, of course, would would love to work with the Tourism Convention Bureau. I don't really know anyone there, and it's it's sort of you know you kind of just have to like know the right person to, so that they that they get it that they can see that you know corals can be kind of a, a, a real an icon for the city. The only thing in terms of like the cam is just one easy. That was the first yeah. thing I thought of is just because we're always trying to, right now we're going to be battling the pollution thing yeah. and the idea that there is actually sea life here and that what's going on elsewhere, we're yeah. okay. Yeah. I mean, that's one way of combat. So I just thought of that would be a way of funding. So because I see the idea of this aside from tourism dollars, I mean, obviously, but just as a thought of funding. Yeah. Yeah, Deerfield but Beach just paid paid for one. Convention Bureau. Good <laughs> question. Yeah, you uh, you mentioned about the dive site. Uh, mm -hmm. That's and it also said that it's about ten uh, ten years away. Is that a well, theory, or you like <laughs> that, that? Yeah, I mean, there's absolutely no. We have we have no um, 
real funding or plan to actually be able to put it in the, in the crater, but it's just one of those things where if we're still here doing what we're trying to do, that would be where our attention would go to create some sort of artistic intervention. Um, it would also be great to do a snorkel trail parallel to the Miami Beach itself um, so that people can swim off the beach and it also acts as a storm surge protection in a hurricane to have sort of like a barrier artificial reef in front of the, um, the whole length of, of Miami Beach. So, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways in which you can sort of kill two birds with one stone. Have you approached anybody with this? Um, the one hotel wanted, wanted to do something out in front of, they wanted an, an installation, but then when they found out how expensive it was going to be, they were like... What are we looking at? Um, in order for the Army Corps to use uh, the barge that you need to be able to deploy um, an artificial reef um, is $100,000 a day, just, for the, just to rent the boat. <laughs> Even though we're just putting concrete on the bottom, you know, which so, so what costs... What would be the budget for something? What's that? What would be the budget for something? Um, depends on how long. Uh, the, the project specifically in front of um, the one hotel was going to be like a $300,000 project. So, expensive, but, you know, not that expensive. <laughs> How has the uh, study of coral reefs uh, transformed and impacted your life? And how would you like this talk to serve as a potential impact for transformation in our lives? Sure. Um, people, I guess, you know, a really basic question is why, why are coral reefs important? Uh, why should we care? Um, coral reefs are kind of like the, the keystone uh, ecosystem of the of all of the world's oceans, so fisheries are dependent upon them. Um, you know, besides humans, corals are the only other animals on space that build, or are the only other animals on Earth that build colonies you can see from space. Um, so, you know, to a certain extent, in the in the coral morphologic worldview, corals are kind of the spirit animal of planet Earth. You know, when you when you take a step back from the planet, we're a pale blue dot. You know, as Carl Sagan would say, um, and you know we're an ocean planet, um, and so, um, and like I said, they, they build they build cities that you can that we can see from space. So, um, I guess if something to take away from today, specifically, um, is to yeah really understand that um, you know these are kind of the the builders. Um, they build the foundation of the ecosystem. They build the foundation of, of basically of cities, um, and and that without them, you know, life on Earth I think would be incredibly depressing. Um, I don't think as a species we can really um, get by on a planet if, where we've basically, you know, created a toxic ocean where coral reefs aren't going to be able to survive. Um, so the health of the coral reefs I think is directly connected to sort of the, the health of humanity. Um, and we're at, a, we're at a critical point where we need to figure out what it is that, what the future kind of brings. I mean, we're still dealing with a huge amount of people that don't believe that humans are capable of changing the climate. It's like humans are capable of, of developing star power and nuclear weaponry and nuclear energy, but we're not able to raise the, the temperature a couple of degrees. I mean, it's kind of an absurd concept that, um, that we as great, and technologically um, advanced species as we are isn't capable of altering our climate, um, which we are. So, um, you know, we need to we need to be thinking about life in a in a longer time scale. You know, we tend to think about things in seventy year spans. You know, the lifespan um, of a of a human, but really, you know, things on geologic scales happen over thousands and millions of years. And that's something that we really need to kind of keep in mind. We have a very selfish outlook, and corals, I think, are one way in which we kind of can recognize this longer, um, this longer view of life on Earth and future generations. Carmen here. Love the hair. You're like a human coral. Thanks. It just grows. I'm weird because it just grows this way. There's nothing in my hair. It's true. Water, right? I mean, is there any way that, it, that those can intersect to maybe get the people dealing with the rising waters 
to invest in what you're doing? Right. Um, probably that, you know, and in the long term, the threat to Miami is, I think, not the slow creep of sea level rise, even though it's definitely a threat. It's going to be a big storm. Um, so when you have a big storm, you know, you need to have storm surge protection. And you can build artificial reefs that mitigate that storm impact. And coral reefs are really important around the world you know, to protect um, the coastline. So um, you know, I think that that's probably where that the sort of, um, as far as protecting South Florida and you know, the land that we do have while we do have it, um, you know, creating these artificial reefs is a way to, to protect uh, um, the shoreline. Yeah. Uh, just one thing. Uh, I remember uh, I saw some pictures of a uh, submerged rice. Somewhere. Right. Yeah, that's down in the Keys. So that's around. Yep. That's the keys. Yeah, that's and that's. I think the. It was a president. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Is that the underwater the Christ of the abyss? I think is what it's called. Um, is I think the most. Uh, dived on spot in the Florida Keys. Um, and it, it is, in fact, probably the inspiration for the work that took place down in, in Cancun. So, yeah, you know, it's like we see how successful it is there. It sometimes is frustrating because we try to get that up here and people don't, still don't, they see the Keys as the place where the coral reef is and they don't see Miami as, as a place that has a coral reef. Uh, technical thing. So, the presence of this uh, uh, abundant corals. Uh, Mm -hmm. Is that a reflection of a low contamination levels in the water? Um, what? Yeah, to I mean, to a certain extent, um, you know, because we have the shipping channel, um, every incoming tide flushes flushes the city. So you know, we have good we have a good turnover. So you know, the pollutants never really build up too much. The further away you get from the inlet, the probably the um, the dirtier the water. Um, you know, a lot of a lot's been made about the. The, the runoff from Miami Beach and, the, and sort of like the, the E. coli that they're, they're, they're finding from these pumps. But the reality is you think of the mainland, you think of uh, Miami River and how much pollution comes out through those canals and has always, you know, or has, has been for decades. Um, you know, it's, if anything, probably the water in Biscayne Bay is probably cleaner than it was 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Um, but at the same time, we've got new coral diseases, um, last couple of years have been really, really um, bad for corals out in Biscayne National Park. Um, so, you know, it's sort of, uh, it, it hasn't really, overall it hasn't been great for the corals. Um, but the corals inside the city, I think, are, there's less incidence of disease here than there is out in that Biscayne National Park, which is, uh, you know, remarkable. It's like adaptation to that. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's either, if you either, Adapt or die. So you know the larvae that settle here, if they if they aren't resilient, they're just going to die, and that'll be it. Um, the ones that survive are the are the, the, the survivors. Any other questions? Well, Colin will be here for a little while longer, so you can talk yeah. to close. But let's let's thank you. Thank you.